What's going on YouTube? This is Ipsag. We're doing response from Hack the Box, which definitely deserves the insane difficulty. It gets its name because we have to stand up a bunch of servers on our box to respond to this. So we stand up web, DNS, SMTP, and LDAP, I believe, throughout all these steps. It starts off with us having to build a custom proxy in order to access a chat application that exists on the box that enables us to fish a user. And with access to his browser, we do a cross-site protocol forgery attack to access a FTP server and download a file and send it back to us, which contains credentials to log into the server. From there, we exploit a race condition in another script to get access to a different user. And that user has a PCAP and some memory dumps in the PCAP, you can see there's an encrypted interpreter stream, so we have to manually parse that interpreter thing, getting the AES key out of a memory dump. That extracts some information. Uh, there's a screenshot that has a piece of an SSH key, and we have to rebuild the SSH key to get into the box. It sounds really tough. It is, so let's just jump in. As always, we start with an nmap, so dash sc for default scripts, sv, enumerate versions, oa, output all formats, put in the nmap directory and call it response and then the IP address of 10.10.11.163. This can take some time to run, so I've already ran it. Looking at the results, we have just two ports open, the first one being SSH on port 22, and its banner tells us it's an Ubuntu server. We also have HTTP on port 80, and its banner tells us it is Nginx. It also says it is redirecting to www.response.hcb, but let's just go take a look at it. So 10.10.11.163, and indeed, it does direct us over here. So I'm gonna do sudo vi etsy host, and we'll add 10.10.11.163. I'm gonna do response.htb and also the www.response.htb as well. And then when we refresh the page, we can see, well, a web page. And it's just talking about some type of service that they do some scanning for TLS, uh, Cypher, Certificate, Heartbleed, Things like that. So it looks like it's an online scanning thing. Um, we have a potential email address right here. And oddly enough, the address is in the US, but I want to say this is like the UK country code. That's not the US country code because it's plus one, but um, <laughs> I just found that funny. Um, so don't really see too much. I'm going to press control U to look at the source to see if this is like WordPress or something like that. You can generally tell by some HTML if it's using like a CMS or something. Don't see anything interesting here. So I'm going to start a Go Buster. So Go Buster directory mode dash u http www.response.htb word list opt sec list discovery web content graph small words dot text. And we want to see if this is like PHP or HTML or what is this? So index.html returns a page. PHP says not found. So slash index not found. I'm gonna guess it's a static site just because it's only HTML. And generally I won't put like dash extension HTML in. So we'll just do this and see if we get any pages. So there's a CSS, an image, assets. Those really aren't that interesting. Uh, fonts directory as well. A status page. So let's try checking out slash status. If we go here says API status pending, chat pending, monitored service. So we're getting some type of information. I'm gonna open up uh, my developer tools, specifically the network tab and reload to see everything it's doing. And we see a request going out to proxy.response.htb. So let's add that into our host file. So let's see, proxy response htb. And now when I refresh the page, we can see um, it says the API server is running, the chat's running, and things like that. We could use the developer tools to get um, all the information here, but at this point, I'm going to go into Burp Suite just because I'm more comfortable in Burp Suite. So intercept is on there, intercept on here, refresh the page, uh, get status. I'm going to ignore that. It's doing main.javascript.php, um, which is a bit odd. It's javascript.php. I'm just going to um, intercept the response to this. So response to this request, forward it, and we can see it's giving us a bunch of JavaScript. So there's probably something in this JavaScript that's dynamic just because it ended in .php, but we'll just move on and see what's happening here. It's doing a options on fetch, which is common for APIs. Options gonna tell um, like 
what HTTP verbs can be used. So if I intercept, oh, uh, it... okay. Uh, it just says 200 okay, and here's the verbs that we can use. Delete, get, head, options, patch, post, and put. So those are the options we can use on that endpoint. And finally, we send a post to slash fetch, and that's going to proxy.response.htb, and we send it the URL, um, API response HTB URL digest, uh, saying it's a get method, then we're doing a session and session digest. If I intercept the response to this request, um, I'm guessing it's gonna show up after this post. Get blog post. I guess this is the response right here. Um, we got the body in base64. If we highlight all the base64, burp uh, decodes it for us. Uh, it's a bit painful to see there. I'm just going to echo. And then paste in this, base64-d, and we can jq since it was json. So we see the results of it hitting, what URL was this? I want to say this was the api.chat.htb. Let's see. Forward. Let's see. Let's just go through this again. So we get status. We're going to do the options. And then we fetch. So we got API. Getting servers, getting chat status. So everything went to API dot whatever. So let's sudo vi etsy host. And we can add API dot response dot htb. And we try navigating to it. We get 403 forbidden. So it looks like the only 127.001 can hit that API server. At least the internet cannot. So I'm just going to double check to make sure I did not miss any single host in this. So we get status, status, fetch. And then we can send this to repeater, send this to repeater. Send that to repeater, and then we're over. So this one is going to be called, let's see, API. We send this, and this body, I think, is the one we looked at. Let's see. Echo, base64. Dash D, JQ dot. Okay. So it got this, and then I think it's going to get chat status and get servers next, right? So this is get servers. We can copy this. Decode it. So it's going to get test server. get servers, and then let's check out this very last one. And this is going to find chat.response.htb. So we have another one. So let's do uh, v etsy host. Don't forget to run that with sudo. Put that in, and let's try going to chat.response.htb. Uh, it is intercepting, so let's turn intercept off. And we also get forbidden. So what we want to do probably is, um, let's see, let's just name this. We want to be able to change this URL to go to chat.response.htb so we can see what this website is. So if we just change the URL here, uh, we get invalid URL digest. So this is going to be some type of checksum. We can look at the length of this. So if we do echo-n, wc-c, it's 64. I'm going to guess, I think that's a SHA-1 sum. Um, let's just SHA-1 sum. Uh, maybe SHA-256 sum. That's definitely not it, I don't think. We can just wc-c, 41. Let's see. That looks about the right length. Let's see the length of this. So it's probably a SHA-256 sum just based upon length. Um, 
So the first thing I'm looking at it, which is weird, is this session. And the session is the same across all three of these requests. And the session digest, of course, is the same. So session digest is definitely the SHA-1 of this. And it's probably some like HMAC or something. So there's a secret that we don't know. That being said, if we analyze this request again, so let's turn intercept on. And then refresh. We get status. Let's send this one. I'm going to call this main.js.php. We have this cookie here, right? And the cookie may be creating the session, right? Because uh, this is PHP session ID. Um, and if the same secret is used to sign the session as it is the URL, we have control over the PHP session ID. So the first thing I want to do is see if this changes if we update this. So I'm just going to put PHP session to please subscribe. And we see currently it's F888, right? So I'm going to send this. I'm going to go back to the session digest. And we see AF36. So yes, we do control this. Now, I don't know if the um, script is taking just the variable or also the name of this, right? So let's take a look. I think it was AF3. Where is it? So AF36. Get rid of PHP session ID. And we're going to see. Uh, okay, we can follow redirection. Follow redirection. I wonder if we need a PHP session ID. I'm guessing the page requires that. So I wonder if we did PHP session ID and we give it a URL. So let's do HTTP chat.response.htb like that. And it errors out, but we do get a page and we have three matches on session digest. So let's take this session digest and copy this. And what we'll, where do we put it in? I think this get chat status is where we've been editing. I'm going to put this session digest in here. We're going to send it and we get a page back. So it looks like that we have a way to bypass the certificate checking or not certificate, like the signing of this because we can force the server to sign anything we want. So let's base 64 encode this. And we can just call this chat.html, I guess. And if we look at it, it looks like it is uh, probably a view app or something. I'm just seeing the CSS app dot whatever dot uh, CSS. And it says it's not going to work properly without JavaScript. We also have a place to download the source code. So if we do files chat source dot zip, we could download the source. So let's create just a quick Python script to abuse this proxy so we don't have to keep going in burp repeater and things like that. So I'm going to open up Visual Studio Code. I'm just going to do code. And I started using code, not Codium, just because I like using the um, GitHub Copilot. It's, I think, $10 a month that I paid for. So um, that's why I'm using code, not Codium. So let's create a folder. I'm going to call this proxy. And we can just create, I'll call it main.py. The first thing we want to do is import requests because this is going to be the library we use to make web requests, right? And then I'm going to do import re since I want regular expressions. That's going to be so I can pull the session digest. And let's see, what other one will we need? Probably base64, right? So I'm going to import base64 as well. And then we're going to create a method. I'm going to call it get digest on the URL. And let's see, I'm going to call cookie is equal to, and we can say PHP sess ID and URL, right? So that's going to be the cookie we use. And we can do requests. 
dot get. It's funny. It thinks I'm doing a seesaw challenge. That's the uh, GitHub Copilot with like smart auto completion things. So HTTP www dot response dot HTB slash status. And I think it was main dot JS dot PHP. Let's double check that. Um, it's gonna be really funny when a lot of people use Copilot on like hack the box and it auto solves scripts of machines for you. That's a way I did not think of getting spoiled. Um, but I digress. So now we make that request and then we want to search the request. So um, call it res for result is equal to re.search. And I don't think that's what the digest was. Um, let's go back here. We want session digest, session digest like that. Okay. And then just hex like that. And then we end on this and we want to do grouping. So I'll put the hex in parentheses. And let's see, I can probably just end it on the single quote. I'm going to add the bracket and semicolon as well. Okay. We can print session digest like that and return res group one. And now I'm just going to do git digest HTTP chat dot response HTB. So I just want to see if this works. So we're going to run it and we get a session digest of 186B90. Let's just make sure that's what it was. So now we have the script working. What we want to do is now have this download the file, right? So I'm going to do download URL. And we're also going to call this like that. And we can say, um, we'll do URL digest is equal to get digest URL. Okay. So now we have to actually create the payload. In this sense, the payload is going to be um, this object right here. So we need URL, URL digest. So URL, then URL digest. Then the next thing we need is method. And I guess we can leave it. I'm assuming later on, we're going to, have to change this to be dynamic, but for downloading the source code, we can just use a get. So session, uh, I guess we can hard code all this. It really does not matter. And then session digest is going to be this. Okay. And now we can do r is equal to request. I think it was smart enough to know everything I wanted to do. Uh, no, we don't get main.js.php. I'm guessing it just saw that from the URL up above. But we actually want to go to proxy.response.htb slash fetch. And then it's not data. This is JSON. And we can return R. So if we do, um, we can do R here as well. Download URL and print R.text. So let's just see if this works. Said session digest. It's making the request. It's taking a while and it failed. Um, so HP connection pool www.response. So where did it fail? I don't know why it was going to this again. So I'm going to click here to set a breakpoint. I'm going to see if it actually gets to line 23. It does. So we step over. 
It's now making the request to proxy.response.htb, and it gave us a 400 error. So let's, in the debug, r dot, so I'm not sure why. Does it give us anything? Is there r dot text? So max retries, it's still trying to get to status main HTB. What? Oh, because it doesn't know this URL. Okay, um, I guess that makes sense. So maybe we should just try changing this to chat dot response dot HTB. <laughs> it's funny it thinks flag dot text is what I want. Um, let's try this again. So I'm guessing the web server actually doesn't know what www.response.htb is, and that's where that error message is coming from. It's not me making the request. It's me telling the proxy to make the request and it coming back with an error is what I think. So now we got a response 200. That looks good. And if we do r.txt here, we get the base 64. So this is now looking much better. So from this, what we want to do is download the source code. So echo, oh, we have the source here. So we want files chat source.zip. So let's go back to the code and we can just paste this. And here, we probably don't want to print r.txt. We're going to print r.json. And we can just skip over this. And there we go. So we have probably the zip written in this giant base64 blob. So what I'm going to do is just write this to a file. So um, let's say f is equal to r and then body. And then we can say... Um, we have to base64 unencode this. So we can do base 64b 64 decode this. And then with open, write, and that should be it. So there we go. A response object is not iterable. Oh, um, let's see. This needs to be r dot json body like that see if this works i'm not sure if it will bytes like object not io buffer let's see so this will be file b64 or let's do response is equal to r.json response body like this And what we did here is a bad name. So I'll call this data. And then we'll write data. So what happened is I trusted the AI, the AI wrote code, and it reused a variable name. That looks better. If I go into where I am, we have chat source.zip. So I'm going to make the directory chat source, go in here. And we'll unzip chat source.zip. And we have the source code here. So we can just go back to Visual Studio Code, go to the chat source, and we can see the source code here. Um, I don't think it's going to help us that much. I think the intended way you'd make some modifications to this, but I'm just going to build kind of a pseudo proxy to the chat service so we can interact directly with it. The one interesting function here, though, is this authenticate user. We can see if username is equal to guest and password is equal guest, then it returns true. So if we can get to the login of this server, we know we can log in with guest guest. Then we have a check after that that's making sure the username is alphanumeric. And the reason why it does this is to probably prevent against some type of injection because right down here we see it's using LDAP. So it's probably trying to prevent us from doing any type of LDAP injection with that. 
Uh, then we have this authenticate option. And I don't know exactly where this thing goes. Um, goes to weird interface in some library. But let's get access to this chat application. And one of the main issues we had is when we go to um, the chat app, I think that's this. If we just do vim chat.html, uh, we got to go up one directory. It gives us this, right? Because we need to actually interact with a browser. So what I'm going to do is modify our Python code we just wrote to act as a man in the middle so a browser can hit that URL. Um, the git digest function, I think, is going to be fine. Um, I do want to make one small change here and let us say if not res. So we're doing a little bit of error checking here. And I really should use a logging library. Um, but we'll just use print statements. So there we go. And then URL digest here, we can say um, if not URL digest return none. Okay. So that's just slight error checking in case something breaks. I don't expect to ever hit this, but who knows, right? So let's see, on this download URL, what are we going to have to do? Um, let's see. Okay, I got it. So what we're going to do is do a slight hack, and we're going to say URL is equal to HTTP chat response dot HTB slash URL. And the reason why we're doing this is I'm going to stand up a web server, and that web server is going to just forward all the data. So let us um, go and import a new library. So from HTTP server, import HTTP server, and simple HTTP request handler. So if you've ever used like python-module HTTP server, that's the module we are using. And then what we're going to do is create a class. So we'll do class server, and then simple HTTP request handler, and then def do git, right? We can comment this stuff out, and all git requests from this web server go here. So we can say the request is equal to download URL, and then we do self.path, and I don't want the, um, slash, so we just do this. And if we print, uh, actually, I'll just print self.path so we can see what this looks like, right? So you can see what's happening. And then we can start making the request. So self send response. And we want to send the status code from a request. So r dot status code, like that. And let's see. We can get rid of that. We don't need that. The other piece I need to do, we can set the content type. We can end headers. And then we will write the content. So let's just see what happens with this, right? Uh, we also have to start the server. So let's do HTTP server, and then we can bind on all ports. I'm gonna use port 3000, uh, uh, all IP addresses, and we're gonna use port 3000. And then the server object, that's the class that we made, and then serve forever. So I think this is going to run a server as long as we don't have any errors that are too bad. And now if I do localhost 3000, I should get a response, right? Okay, so we got the page. Uh, we have to decode this body, right? But if we look at the path, the path was just slash right there. But let us go here. And let's see, body's going to be JSON. So let's do 
data is equal to r dot json. And then we want to write the data body. And we want to base64 decode this. And then because this gives me it as binary, I want to decode. Otherwise, it's going to have like that B single quote thing, right? So now if I refresh, refresh here, we get an error. UTF-8 can't decode byte. Let's just see what um, this was. So copy, con uh, control KC does a comment. So now I can get rid of this decode. And we can see exactly what this looks like. Maybe I didn't need to do it because it is going to the right function and maybe that expects binary, right? Still have an error. Bytes like object, not string. So maybe we want to encode. Let's refresh. Okay, so we definitely need to decode this. Coded is equal to that. And if we write decoded, what's going to happen? This is where we erred last time. Invalid start byte. And I, if this fails, I'll set a breakpoint. Nope, this looks better. I see internal chat. And we have a lot of weird, like, visibility things. I bet if I do guest guest, is this going to work? Um, we're getting some cores errors. So there's two things we're going to have to do. Um, the CSS will probably have to set the content type right correctly because a browser, I don't think, is displaying that. And also JavaScript, I think we will as well because um, we're setting the content type of everything to text HTML. But we want to be able to set content type correctly. Um, there's probably a Python library that takes an extension and sets content type. Um, I'm gonna pause the video and check real quick because that would be the more optimal way. What I was going to do is just hard code everything, right? So we could say like if um, self.path.endsWith.css, then we set the header of this to be um, text CSS, right? but this isn't really that optimal. So I wanna see if there's a better library to do this. Gonna pause the video and do some research. Okay, so it seems to be super simple. There's just a library called MIME types. So we just import this. And then if we go back down to this, we can say, um, shoot, I need to get self.extension or something. So what we want to do is say mime type is equal to mime types guest type. I did not see that. There is a um, types underscore map function. But let's just see what happens here. I'm going to set a breakpoint, and then we're going to play with this a little bit. So hit this, refresh, and if I go to... Mime type, it's telling me none here. I wish I knew how to make that bigger. Um, but this variable is set to none. So this mime type guest type did not work. But there is a bunch of functions in self. And this is what I like about Visual Studio is I can just go in here and see what is here, right? Um, extension. I wonder if I already had it. Let's see, self dot extensions map. And let's see. I'm sure there's a way I can just reference this, right? Huh. I've never really looked at a request like this. Um, I may just do a split and get everything after the last period which isn't the best way to do it, but off the top of my head, I don't know how to use 
this extension map. Um, so if I just have self.path and let's set, or let's see. Let's go forward, because we're gonna hit this again, right? Now we got self.path as CSS. And extension map did not update, so okay. So what we want to do is dot split on period and then grab the last one. So if we do negative one, grabs the last. Awesome. And then the mime types dot types underscore map and then paste this. Let's see, object string has no types map. It said CSS. Dot CSS. Huh. I thought that would work. Okay, so I paused the video and found a different example that we're going to play with. So let's try just grabbing this entire thing and we're going to stop this program. And I'm just going to create a new test.py program and we can import mime types. I'm gonna say mime is equal to mime types dot mime types like this. And then we can say mime type is equal to mime dot guess type like this. I just want to see what this equals and print mime type, run it. And mime types has no guest type because I have a capital T text CSS. That's what I want. So let's run this again. Mime type. Sweet. So this is definitely what we want to do. We're going to go to main. And I'm going to create a new function. So def get mime type and then path. And let's go back to test.py, grab it, path like that. We can say if mime type, we can probably just, eh, we can return that else return none. Okay. Or instead of return none, I'm going to return text HTML. That's just a safe one, right? So we can get rid of this. And for the header, we can say get mime type self.path. Start this web server up. Refresh this page, and we can see it looks a little bit better. But still, if we try to log in with guest guest, we get a bunch of cores errors, and it's actually directing us to chat.response.htb because um, the JavaScript is telling us to go there. And we want to replace all chat.response.htb with localhost 3000. So let's go back in the code. And let's see, decoded, we can replace this. So um, decoded.replace and chat.response.htb with localhost 3000. So now whenever the website says go to this, it directs us to localhost 3000. Refresh the page. There's no threading on this web server, so it is a little bit slow. Um, let's see, a bytes like object is required, not string. 
Let's see. Decode it is equal to decoded.encode and decode. Maybe that works. Oh, this is going to be, this is probably going to error because um, there are some actual byte like objects in this, like the images, right? And that's why we can't decode and encode everything. So we only want to do the replace function on like JavaScript files, right? So we can probably say um, if I think it's I'm trying to think how to do ends with in Python. Uh, we can say if I do a comment if self path ends with dot js and tell the AI. I was hoping Copilot would save me there, but um, let's see. If decoded dot, sweet, there we go, ends with. I don't know if I do a B dot JS. And then we can say decode is equal like that. And this is actually um, self.path. And I'm actually going to set a breakpoint here so I can see exactly what um, decoded looks like. Refresh the page. And if we go here, decoded. Maybe it works if I just step over. I think it does. So go back and keep running. Let's see. Terminal. We do have some errors here. Let's see, what line is this? A bytes like object is required, not string. Oh, I wonder if, there we go. I think I just need bytes like objects there. Yep, that was it. So now I can log in with guest guest and it does a post and that's when everything errors because our script or our proxy only handles gets. So we have to make this also handle a post request. So just like in the do get, we can do a def do post and then self as well. And we have to set the data. So we do self data string and it looks like it knows what I want to do. So all we're doing is reading um, the data portion of the HTTP request up to the content length. And then if we have data, we can set the request. So download URL. And this is where we're going to have to tell it a difference between post and get, right? So self.path, one like this, and data string. So in our download, Let's do method. And then here we can also say data is equal to, uh, defaulted to none. So let's do method. And what we don't know actually is going to be how we send it data. Um, I'm just going to put data is equal to data. Uh, well, let's see. I'm actually going to say if data, then payload data is equal to data. Because I don't want to give the web server a data piece of the payload in a get request, right? And I guess I could have said if method is equal to post, but that's how we're going to try it. 
So let's see. That looks good. And then else we can download file. And we don't give it a data string, right? Yeah. And then pretty much the same exact thing here. So we can paste this. So status code, content type, and headers. And then self.write file write. That looks fine. Okay. So we pretty much just mimicked the uh, get request. The only difference is we modified this download URL to be um, accepting a post. And for download URL, we have to modify this. This is gonna be get. Let's see, where else do we have download URL? Post, post. Okay. I'm going to start the server back up. Looks like it's running. I'm going to log in with guest guest. And it did error somewhere. Object not JSON serializable. So I'm going to guess that's over in the post request. So let's try this again. So guest guest. And see if we hit a breakpoint. We don't even hit the post. So I'm going to stop this. And then let's see where the error is. Proxy main line 62. So I think we hit the post. We just didn't do the data string correctly which me and my use of Copilot is going to screw me over. So if I look at self.data string, that looks fine. That's definitely the data we want to send. So let's step in, go here. So if I look at data, That's looking fine. So let's look at what the payload looks like. So URL. So we probably have to decode this. We can see right here the data and then it's got that B um, single quote. That's probably gonna be the error message. So let's see, data dot decode. Let's run this again. see did send it again step in look at payload method post i don't see data so i think it posted nothing So we're here, let's go in. Okay, let's see what payload looks like now. Still no data. Let's stop the server, start it back up. I don't want to break. Let's see. In the post, I'm just going to manually set the mime type. I think that, well, that's not error. Let's just set a breakpoint at a logical place where the data string is, because when we're sending the post request, that's when the issue 
happens only when we have data, right? So now we broke there. We're trying to send it. And let's see what self.data string is. It has a underscore. Oh, I'm going to guess um, it's probably a encoding issue because that's not going to be proper JSON. Let's just see what happens. So we step into this, go over, set everything. And then if we look at data, we do have data here. So we go in, we have payload. Now let's look at the, what the payload looks like. So here's data. And I'm going to guess this doesn't get JSON serialized correctly because that's just nasty, right? So we step in, we make the request, and let's see, r.text, missing parameter body is what we actually get. So there's a few errors we have. We probably have to base64 encode that, but also we're calling the parameter data and it wants body. So set this. Let's do the same exact thing. Step into this. And then the next breakpoint we want to hit is here. And now let's look at what payload looks like. Instead of data, we called it body. And now we can do r.text. And it says invalid base64 encoded string. So we probably want to base64 encode the body. So if data, then what we can do is base64.b64 encode data.decode. Let's try this. Step into this, go all the way down. And then if I look at what the payload looks like now, uh, it's just one. That's not right. So r.text, base64 encoded string. Um, I don't know why it was trying to encode one. I probably should like stop the web browser because I don't know exactly what it is sending. See what the payload looks like. Is it still just one? Nope, we have an actual base64 string here. So now r.text, and that's equal to some base64. This is looking better. So let's copy this. Echo base64-d, and it says OK. So I am satisfied with that. Let's just let this server run and log in with guest guest and see what happens. It's definitely thinking. Do we have just a bunch of errors viewing the terminal? I don't see any error messages here. Refresh the page completely. We have one error, a broken pipe, but it's looking like a lot more requests are coming in. And we have a chat. And I'm online, we have admin offline and Scryh offline as well. Bob's online, so I'm gonna message him, hello. And I'm gonna go back here just to see if there's a bunch of error messages, and I don't see many. So that's looking good. We don't see any responses. We can give him like a minute to respond to see if anything comes in. A post request just did. And Bob is telling me he needs to talk to an admin now. I'm just gonna say, I am an admin and see what he says, right? So it looks like we have a decent proxy working right now. And I don't see a bunch of error spewing here. So I'm gonna call it a win. Um, see what he says. Let's see, we can get rid of that. So 
right now we probably have to become an admin is my guess. So if I go back to this web code, let's see. Uh, proxy chat source server index.js. So the very first thing I'm going to do, well, is not log in with guest guest. We want to try logging in with an admin. And maybe I can just use a star for the password and log in if it's got some like no filtering at all. Um, highly doubt that's going to work, but let's try it. So let's go into the storage tab, see how this website is remembering me. Uh, if we can delete this session ID, refresh the page. Hopefully I get back to a login. If I don't, then um, it probably goes down to me hard coding something in the web server, like this session in Session Digest. It's not even loading. There we go. So we're good. So I'm going to do admin and the password of um, star. And then click login. Uh, it's not letting me log in. So let's intercept this request. Go to burp suite. And I'm going to put a long request in. And it looks like I did not see it. Okay, here it is. So during the post, there we go. Well, again, and I'm guessing that did not work because we're not logged into the application, right? I think percent's also a wildcard in this. So we can try percent as well. So password is equal to percent. But the other thing I'm noticing is we have this auth server right here. So if this doesn't work, we can probably just stand up our own LDAP server and authenticate that way, right? So that doesn't work. Um, let's do admin. And I probably should just send this to the repeater tab. So go to repeater, send it, and it says, okay. doesn't log in. So I'm guessing there's something after OK. But what I want to do is try changing the auth server to 10.10.14.8. And LDAP, I think, is 389. So let's listen on that port. Send the request. Uh, session ID unknown. So I'm guessing we probably want to intercept this way. Hit this, get socket. Okay, alt server. We're going to change this to 10, 10, 14, 8. Forward. And here we can see it is making a LDAP request. The user ID is admin, then users response, and then I guess this is the password. So we could either stand up our own LDAP server, or we can do a really nasty hack because um, LDAP's going to respond with a predetermined string, or at least bytes, that says if a request is valid. And instead of standing up an LDAP server, I'm just going to um, send the bytes that say an LDAP or the query was successful. And to do that, I use chat GPT. So let's hope it gives me the response it did yesterday. Um, I want to say I asked it and it's something like, can you give me an example LDAP response to a bind, or we should say successful bind request in hex format and see what it says. Um, it's taking its time. Hopefully it doesn't respond with like the system is down, but it looks like it is responding to us and we have hexadecimal and it's telling us exactly what each piece is which is definitely handy um 
I'll just let it keep going on so you have this in case it decides to not give you the same format. But um, I don't know exactly all the pieces of this. But this does let us paste it into um, Netcat and just respond with success. So if we copy this. We can go back here and say um, NCLV and P 389 I'm gonna do K and then let's do echo this XXD dash R dash P I want to say NC goes on this side NCLV and P 389 and we probably have to erase all these spaces Come on. There we go. And run sudo with netcat. So anytime I nc to localhost 389, it responds with that. Uh, maybe only the first time. So I'll get rid of the K. Now, if I attempt to... Let's... Um, Let's see. Yeah, we can just attempt to log in. So admin, admin, and burp suite is going to be set to intercept. We log in, we go forward, and we're going to change this LDAP server to 10.10.14.8. And then it should respond, go to us. So we see it made the connection. And I want to say we responded with success. But we didn't. Huh. Let's see. There's something wrong with, I guess, the byte stream. Um, it magically worked for me when I did it, but maybe it doesn't. Um, let's see. I am going to make one slight change to this. I'm looking for my server where I replace this. And what we want to also do is replace, um, what was it, ldap.response.htb? And we're going to just replace it with 10.10.14.8. So we don't have to keep using Burp Suite. Let's restart the server. Uh, refresh the page. We can turn Burp Suite off. So when I log in with admin admin, We definitely see the request to us, but it did not let us log in. So I'm going to pause the video, and I think I have notes of exactly what my hex response was, and we can see the difference here. Sorry for the sloppy cut. Um, I'm not exactly sure what the issue is. Um, when I asked it yesterday, it gave me this as the response, and this is the one that appears to work. And you can see the difference. This one's 12 byte, the other one's 26 byte. Um, I don't know what the multi byte field thing is, but if I just take this response and put it in, so let's echo this. And now we just try logging in with admin admin. It logs us in as admin. So I'd probably recommend standing up an LDAP server. Maybe if there's time, I'll do that at the end of the video. Um, I thought this would be the easier route, but OpenAI apparently is inconsistent, and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't with the response it gives you. I'm guessing it's just like a different LDAP version or something like that. But now that we're logged in as admin, we can say, hello, Bob, and see what Bob responds with. So, um, yes, you can and see what Bob says. Trying in both cases, yes, and lowercase, yes. I found this step to be a little bit flaky. I guess there's just a lot of time things, or maybe it's how I'm doing this little um, WebSocket thing. I can go back here to see if there's any hangups. It doesn't look like there is. Um, and Bob tells us he's moved the internal FTP server to this address. 
and it's listening on port 2121, and the creds are FTP user secret 12345. Um, so we can try connecting to this box, NC uh, 1010 1163 2121, add ZV so we can see if it connects, and we get connection refused. So we can't access it, but Bob can. And Bob's also asking us to send him a link. So we can just send him a page um, and see if he connects to it. So sure, it's at HTTP 10.10.14.8. And let's make sure we have a web server listening. So let's do port 80. Uh, we want actually LVNP on port 80. And we'll see if he connects. If he does, then we can build a um, like JavaScript payload that attempts to FTP into this server and see what is um, on it. And we can see right away he has connected uh, with, looks like, Firefox. And we know that's um, him because it came from 10.10.11.163. So let's make a directory called www. And then we just want to create payload.js. And we're going to create a simple JavaScript payload that uses the XML HTTP request because if you've watched my other videos, this is the easiest way to um, make a user's web browser make web request um, on your behalf. And we're going to do a technique that doesn't get a lot of talk about, but it's like a, I want to say like cross protocol request forgery because we're changing the protocol. Um, it's very similar to a bunch of the orange side talks that we've covered before. Um, I'll show it and then we'll do it real quick. So we make a post request and the post is going to be important because uh, the post is what lets us write data at the end of an HTTP request, right? And I'm just doing this to localhost first because I want to show what the request looks like. Then we'll replace this with that 172.18 address Bob told us. Uh, this last piece, this is the asynchronous piece, but now we can do xhr.send, and we just want to send the um, FTP information, right? So we say user, we do a line break, then the password of secret12345, and then we want to get the results of this. In FTP active mode, I want to say, has a command called port, and that allows you to issue FTP commands on one end and then get them out a different way, right? So we're going to say port to 10.10.14.8, and then we have to encode our IP address, and, oh, uh, that's just commas. And then the port, uh, <laughs> it's confusing, um, the actual port of this is going to be in a packed integer format. So it's two bytes. So if we did like 0001, this would go on port one. Uh, this byte is shifted eight bits. So I want to make this 9001 to be stylish, right? So um, what we want to do is see how much 256 goes into 9001, 35 times. So this will be 35. And if we shift 35 over eight bits, uh, is it the other way? We get 8960. So this is gonna be 8960. If we do 35 times 256, we get the same thing. Um, so what this means is right now this 35 is 8960, this is 8961, and we want to make this um, 9000, so we just add a 4 here, because 8960, 8960 plus 41 is 9001. So now we're going to tell it to talk to us on um, port 9001, and I guess that's, um, I guess packed is what that terminology is. And we're just going to do list, which is the FTP command of ls, essentially. And then we give it a line break. Okay. And we, I think we need semicolons here. And that is going to be the payload we send it. 
Um, we also need an index. So HTML, HTML, and script source is equal to payload.js. So if I navigate to this page, hopefully it um, makes us connect to port 21. So I'm going to do nclvnp2121, python3-m, HTTP server. We can make sure this listens on port 80. I don't know if that's a requirement, but it's just nice. So went to localhost, and we got payload. It didn't attempt to connect. Refresh. We got it. Um, I wonder if I need, let's see, I probably missed the actual send portion of this. So v payload.js, and that looks good. We are, didn't forget send, so that should send the request. Um, index, oh, slash script. I'm guessing the uh, HTML being in a different color was my hint. So let's try this again. So we stand up a web server, refresh. And we see the post request now on 127.0.0.1.21.21. And we look at it. It does this HTTP request. And then it does a line break and sends these FTP commands. And what this is going to do is actually make a complete FTP connection. So we're smuggling FTP over the HTTP protocol, essentially. So let's try replacing this payload. Oh, not payload.js. Um, this, and we want to put the IP address here, right? So that's 172.18, I think he said 05, 05. And I think this IP changes uh, based upon the box, so like your spawn. So that looks good. So let's see what happens with this. We should get a connection back um, because of this port command. And we should see the response to this. So. Let's start up a web server and say, let's see, would we say it? Give him this URL again. Hopefully he responds with, he's going to be checking that and we'll see if it indeed does work. Um, I wonder if I should refresh my app. Let's see, did I kill this web server? See, that is running in Visual Studio Code. Looks like it's working. So he got the payload, but it doesn't look like the FTP request came on. Let's just try that again. See what he says. So we did a few line breaks. I can just refresh. Crap. There we go. So he got payload. He's got it twice, and we still don't have an FTP connection. So let's see. We do HTTP 172.18.05. Let's see. Yes, let's make sure we have all this information correct. Let's see, port 2121. True. Log in. Port list. I wonder if it's not 3541. We should probably stand up Wireshark. And then listen on ton zero to see any request that is coming into us. To see if we screwed up the port. Um, let's see. Port not 80. TCP.port does not equal 80. Or TCP.DST port does not equal 80. That did not work. Respond, let's see. Transmission. Is an exclude. Sort 
source port. It's not and, right? I wish you would tell me the FTP information again to make sure we have all that correct. I probably just screwed up the whole chat by making him go here again, but I definitely want to see anything not on this. Have a look. Oh, crap. I want to listen on 9001. I bet that was it the whole time. So, let's see if he comes and gets it. So, the issue was when I was, yep, testing it, I had it on port 2121, so I could show the request, but our port command is what we're actually intercepting, and we put it on 9001. So, we can see there is a file creds.txt. So, what I'm going to do is comment this out, and we want to retrieve creds.txt. So, retr creds.txt save it, and then stand this up again. Give him the link so he clicks on it, and when he does, hopefully it downloads the file creds.txt for us. So give it a second. There we go. And we have a connection. And creds.txt contains FTP, we knew that, but we also have this SSH as Bob. So let's try SSH Bob at 10.10.11.163, paste in the password, and we get shell on response, and there's user.txt. And going back to the Wireshark, um, I can show my troubleshooting would have helped out because if I had another connection, I pulled this Wireshark back up, I would have saw him connect on, or attempt to connect on port 9001. And this is me sending a reset packet back, which is me saying the port is closed. Because at this time, I was just listening on port 2121. So um, this is a valid way to troubleshoot anything like that. Um, if I didn't notice just beforehand, this definitely would have told me. And then we can see my SSH connection. So I could also... Um, do the same thing as SSH, but not going to bother it. We don't need to be Wiresharking anymore. So let's check at what is in Bob's directory. We just have config, cache, whatever. If we go up one directory, we do have another user. And we can go into his directory of this and do an lsla. And it looks like there is an SSH directory. We can't go into it. Um, incident directory, we can't, but we can go into scan. So if I go into scan, we have scan.sh, send report.py, and a few directories. So I'm going to do find.type f, and let's just see what these files are. So the data um, is a bit weird. If I do data, cat it, we can just pipe an echo after so it's a bit cleaner. Just looks like it has a fun fact about each state. Not exactly sure what that means. Um, output log.txt, we have scan.sh. Some NSE scripts, so this looks like nmap scripts. Send report.py, and then all the country names. So I guess the interesting things are send report.py. So if we just look at this, it's a Python script that uh, sends a report from reports at response.htb and it attaches a PDF that says it's your detailed scan report. And it looks like that is all it does. And it accepts everything as arguments, arg1, arg2, arg3. So let's take a look at scan.sh. And it looks like there's a lot more going on in this script than that Python script to send emails. The first thing that stands out is this PWD variable, which generally stands for password. And if we look at how it's used, it's used as a just string in LDAP search 
So we know this is plain text. It's not going to be like a hash or a base64 or anything like that. It's just a straight up password. And since it exists in this one user's directory, I'm going to just try the password for him to see if it works. We can also try root. I'm pretty sure it's not root's password. This box is not that easy, right? So let's go back into the script and just take notes at exactly what it's doing. So just split my pane and we'll do um, notes.txt, I guess, for now. And the first thing it does is looks like it clears out the output folder. So logs and output and slash scan, whatever. And then the next thing we're going to do is that LDAP search. And it looks like it's going to get an IP number. It does a cut as well. So I'm guessing the IP is the second field. So get IP from LDAP. And then for each IP, it says it's going to scan. We can see exactly how it scans. So scanning IP, out file, and we'll use nmap to scan 443. And it looks like it runs a few scripts like enum ciphers, um, hurt bleed and things like that. And then it will create PDF. And how is out file used? Where is out file created? Is this user input? Out file is based upon the IP address and the IP has a regex to make sure it's IP. So there's no way we can really do command injection here. And we get manager UID. So this is the manager's UID. And then we do another thing to get manager um, email. So get manager's email. This is also done through LDAP. Checks if email is valid. And that is this weird regex that I don't even want to try reading. So just assume that's valid regex to check if it is an email and we get SMTP server from this. And I guess we set local DNS to true and do a NS lookup on the IP address. I'm just trying to see where it sets the server. So NS lookup MX records to get mail server, I guess. And then if SMTP server is not found, query it via DNS. So local DNS is equal to false. And we're getting it and go on. So retrieve IP address of this. So how do we get a DNS server? SMTP IP, fail to retrieve. So um, the only thing that I'm confused right now, then we may have missed it, is how it exactly gets an IP address, right? Because um, everything else is from LDAP and it may actually, like a DNS IP could be stored in LDAP as well. So I'm going to, let's create another SSH session to this box actually. So let's go, where was that password? That's the Wireshark, here it is. And I'm gonna create creds.txt, Bob, and put this in. Just in case we clear the screen or do something there. And let's get Bob at 10, 10, 11, 163, paste this in, there we go. So we can go back to scan.sh and let's do this one LDAP query. So I'm going to set the bind DN and PWD. So let's copy this, paste, and now if I echo bind DN, we have it set. We can grab the password. 
Okay, and I think that may be everything we need for this. So we can do user bin LDAP search, then dash x dash d, find dn, pwd, sub, then ou is servers, response, htb. So if we just run this, we can see what we have. So we have test server and 172.18.02. We got Mary, customers, whatever. And I don't see anything that would indicate a DNS server, right? And if we just did the rest of the query, they do a, what is it? Object class is equal to IP host. So this is the exact query it's running. And they, what? Grep IP host number, and then the field too. So we know they're just getting um, that IP address. So that's that LDAP query. Then the second one, pretty much the same thing, but this time it's getting the um, manager. But this should dump everything, so I should see emails or something like that because we have to know how we email the user, but I don't. Oh, um, the OU is the server's OU. That's probably different between the queries. So that's why it's running multiple LDAP queries because the first one is the servers. Then we go to the OU customers to get the manager UID. And then where's the other LDAP? We can just search for LDAP search. So that servers, this one is servers as well. This is customers. So if we go back here, we can change OU servers to customers to dump that information, right? Because there's also grepping mail and that's how it gets that email address. And I'm sure there's other OUs. We could probably just dump the whole thing. We just do DC response, DC HDB. And this will get everything. We have the POSIC accounts of users, this user password, um, let's see, echo N, base64 D. Let's just echo to make it clean. Um, this looks like it's a seeded SHA um, hashing for the password. We could try cracking it, but I don't think we actually get anything from it. So. Um, Right now we have everything we need. We don't know the D, like how it gets the DNS server yet. I probably just missed it. So let's look at the NS lookups. So NS lookup type MX and domain. Domain is gonna be what's after the email address, right? So that's not right. This one has the timeout. Oh, um, after domain, we have IP. So right here is where it's doing it. So it's going to the IP, like the server has to run DNS for it to get the SMTP server. So that's how. Um, we'll use um, scan target for DNS, I guess. And now we mail report. So right now we have to try, we can get the server to scan us and email a report, but we don't know what benefit that is to us. Um, we can get it to like scan us and email us based upon just our ability to be able to manipulate LDAP to put information in there. So it's using NSE scripts, and this is what it emails us. So if I look at output, um, this isn't the email, this is the log. So it's sending the report. If we do LSLA, we can see. Let's see. I don't know what I was trying to show there. I think this is when the box was spun up. I was seeing if it was like writing to this constantly. It doesn't look like it is. Um, if we go into scripts, do a LSLA, we can see one of these NSC scripts is modified March 3rd. So this one may be special. If we want more confirmation, we can MD5 sum each of these files. And if we go to virus turtle and search, if it's a truly unique file, um, virus turtle 
probably does not know about it, right? So we can search for this. No match is found. So VirusTotal has never seen this file, at least with that MD5 sum. We can go to the ciphers and do a search, and we have a hit. It's SSL Anum ciphers. We can go to the details and see it was first seen in 2018. So chances are this has not been modified. It's not part of the challenge. We can look at the Heartbleed script as well and do another search and see this one was seen 2018 as well. So we have to put our focus on this SSL cert.nse. And what I'm going to do is start up a listener on 9001 and write it and so I can send it quickly. So cat SSL cert NC 10, 10, 14, 8, 9001. If I go back to my NC, has a connection, and we can cat it and get the file. So now I'm going to locate the file, and I can see I have a copy in this directory. Let's do a diff and see what's different. Um, right off the bat, I see this local function get state or province name on subject, and then we're reading a file, data, state, or province name, and then dot, dot, and Lua, which is what these NSC scripts are. It's another programming language, is concatenate. So it's concatenating to add this, the subject, state, or province name. And this is part of a certificate. And if it's scanning us and actually using um, our data here, we could say we're not in the state of New York, but we're in the state of dot, dot, slash, dot, dot, slash, dot, dot, slash, IDRSA, and try to grab a SSH key, right? Um, I think I forgot to say the SSH directory, but you know what I mean. So if I look at where subject is taken, oh, actually, it's not subject. Um, yeah, it would be. We want to get this get state or province name. So let's do vim SSL cert and see where this function is used. Uh, cert dot subject. So let's get cert and see where cert is defined, right? So let's do cert space equals local status and cert SSL cert get certificate host and port. And this is going to be our host and port. So this is from our certificate. So as long as the um, script emails us the output of this NSE script, we have an LFI vulnerability. So um, let's stand up everything required to get the server to email us, and then we can do the LFI to see if this user has a SSH key, because I don't think we have permission to his .SSH directory, right? We don't. We just know it exists. So um, let us go into scan.sh, and we have to look at all the queries that we'll have to write to put a box in, right? And the first thing we have to do is um, create the server. And it may be easier to just do it based upon this output, right? Because this is telling us everything we need. So let's close this. Dev SHM V uh, we'll call this ipsec.ldiff. Um, generally, files you add to LDAP are called LDIF. Doesn't really matter. It's just the standard extension. And now we want to just grab an example server. So we can grab this entire thing. Copy. Paste. And then we'll change a few things, right? So the CN is going to be whatever we want to call it. I'm going to call it please subscribe. Um, that's going to be our server. Top host, whatever. Change this to please subscribe. We can probably leave the manager as uh, Mary as long as um, response-test.htb doesn't exist on this box. Because if it resolves that domain, it's going to think it's a local name and it will never attempt to e um, reach out to our IP to do a DNS request. So that's the one thing I'm going to test before we do this. And the IP is going to be 10, 10, 14, 8, right? 
I think that may be all we need. So now if I do LDAP add dash D, CN is equal to admin DC response, DC equals HTB dash W. Um, I forget what the password was. Echo PWD, copy, paste, and dash F, and what we'd call this, um, ipsec ldiff, and we added a new entry. So if I, um, let's just save this, nc lvnp443, so we can see if it ever reaches us, right? But the main thing I want to see is if we see our box. And I don't see it. I wonder if it already scanned and removed it. Let's um, grab this for 10, 10, 14. We don't have anything. So let's add that again. Run it. So it definitely does exist here. Do a less. Look for please subscribe. And we can see our box. So we should get some type of connection on this um, netcat port. Grep 10, 10, 14. I'm just going to sleep 60 and we'll see if it hits it within a minute. It hasn't even been 60 seconds yet and we see the connection open and close. So now we know the server will reach out to us. So now um, let's create a certificate. So let's go in dub dub dub. Um, I'm going to do open SSL request an X509 certificate, no DES for um, no DES encryption, new key RSA 4096. And then the out file is going to be key.pem out cert.pem 56 days. We'll create this for seven days. And we're not gonna do the LFI just because I wanna show exactly how this works first, and then we'll create a new certificate with a um, malicious state, right? So we look at this, we have the two certificates. I'm gonna create a server.py, and then we do from HTTP server import. I should use code uh, Visual Studio for this, but old habits die hard, right? So we import that, we need to import SSL, and we're just using Python to create a um, SSL server. So listen on all ports, 443, and do this. Now we create the SSL piece. So I think that's right, socket. Then key file is equal to, I think we called it key.pem. And I think we called the certificate cert.pem. And the last thing is server side is equal to true. And then we serve the socket like this. So now if I do Python 3 server.py, let's just try making a request on HTTPS localhost. And we get the request. Awesome. So now, oh, we have to stand up a DNS server as well. Um, I'm actually going to use a tool called DNS Mask for this. And we're going to do something a little bit tricky just because most people, when they do um, SSLNP grep 453, uh, oh, I think I already have DNS Mask running here. Um, PS-EF, grep, DNS, I do. Let's just kill this real quick. But most people will have a DNS service running on 53, even if they're not running a DNS server, just because system D likes doing that, right? So I'm going to spin up a DNS server on port 8053, and then we're going to use IP tables to redirect all traffic from our target that tries to reach us on 8053 to... Um, or it tries to reach us on 53 to 8053. That may make more sense once we do it. Um, but I'm just doing that so 
if you do have a service listening on port 53, this whole step still works for you, right? So let's create the DNS mask configuration file. So I'm just going to do dns.conf and I'm just going to do address and then we can say please subscribe.htb to 10.10.14.8 and that's just going to be for demo purposes but um, the address we're actually going to use is like mail.response-test.htb also directing it. And uh, we'll start DNS mask up real quick. So DNS mask. I know I have to set the MX records as well in the config, but we'll do that in a second. So we're going to listen on port 8053. I'm going to specify the config dns.conf. Um, is it dash capital C for config? Yeah. So right now, if I went to the server, do I have dig? I do. We can dig please subscribe dot htb at 10 10 14 8 and it never gets to us right and that's because we have to direct it to port 8053 or do the redirection on our end because if i do sslnp grep for 53 we can see that's where dns mask is listening and again I'm expecting you to have 53 already listing on your box, so you can't use that port. So this is just easier. So I'm going to do IP tables, and we're going to do a pre-routing table. Specify NAT, UDP. The source is going to be anything from 10, 10, 11, 163. And the destination port is 53. We're going to redirect to ports 8053. I'm going to do the same thing, but also specify TCP. So now anything that is sent to port 53 from this box to my box, it will direct it to 8053, which is where DNS mask is running. And we can see um, the response comes back. And I didn't say scribe. There we go. So we get 10, 10, 14, 8. Now, the issue is it's doing an MX lookup, and this is a, I forget what MX stands for. I know, just know it as a mail record, right? So if I do dig with this and we say MX, I want to say, it doesn't give us anything. And the purpose of this is when it queries your domain, you uh, send it um, what the mail servers are. And this is how you can easily identify if people use like um, 365 or Google for email and things like that, because you'll get the MX record, you can see it, right? So you're going to say MX host is equal to response. Uh, so the MX host for this domain, response-test.htb, and we're going to direct it to mail.response-test.htb, like this. And this last one is the priority. And normally, you would give it multiple records, right? So we're going to do mail one and mail two, and I'll clean it up after this real quick. But I just want to demo exactly um, the purpose of MX, right? If you're not familiar with it. So let's start DNS mask back up. Then we can do this again. And uh, we didn't do it for please subscribe. We did it for um, response test.htb. And we see two records. And the reason why you generally have more than one mail server is if this mail server was down and it tried to email you, there's a chance you lost the mail, right? So you always want redundancy. So if this one goes for patching, this one's online to receive mail during the meantime. So that is the purpose of that. The number um, is priority. So the lower one, I think, gets used first. But let's fix this up for simplicity. I only want one mail record. Okay, so now what's going to happen is the server is going to create the report. It's going to do a MX DNS request to our box and see, oh, your mail server is this mail.responsetest.htb. And then it's going to query that. So let's get rid of that. And it's going to say, hey, what's this mail server? And we're going to say that's at 10, 10, 14, 8, at which point it sends us an email. So I'm just going to split these a bit more evenly because this next step, we're just going to run a 
Python um, SMTP server. It's a quick one-liner. So let's do Python 3, the SMTP module, and then debugging server, and we'll listen on 10.10.14.8, port 25. And let's do this with sudo. So now we have a mail server as well. So now when I add this, whenever the user runs scan.sh, it's going to scan a web server, and then do a DNS request, then hit DNS mask, it's gonna pull the MX record, which will give it our IP address of a mail server, and then we'll connect to SMTP, at which point, hopefully, we see the request here. So, um, yeah, I'm guessing it's gonna happen, hopefully, within the next 60 seconds. And we have a error on 443, which is just um, nmap running. It doesn't do a full request. It just hits the scan. I think that is fine, but we don't, oh, there we go. Now we have the email. So let's copy this. So copy this entire thing so we can grab the PDF. So the Python mail server, it just literally um, outputs everything to standard out if you do the one-liner. So now we have that copied. I'm going to vmail.b64 and paste it. And now there's going to be one small tricky thing. Um, when I was doing this box first, I just replaced all these um, b and then quote with like a said. So I did like percent s b like this. And eventually I got invalid base 64 still. And if we are really observant, we see 666 substitutions on 663 lines. Um, every line began with B uh, quote. So why do we get more? Because some lines ended with B quote. So if we go, let's see, do we see it? There we go. There is one right here. So we accidentally removed that, which killed the base 64. So when we do this, we want to do a um, caret B like that. And now 663 substitutions on 663 lines. That is exactly what we want, right? So let's do a single quote and then dollar to remove that last quote on each line. And again, we see 663 on 663, which is good. And now we can base64-d mail to mail.pdf. Uh, I forgot the two. And then when we open mail.pdf, we have the scanning report, right? And let's see, where is it going to output the state, right? Let's see, full country name, Australia, state or province name. So I'm guessing um, right around here where it says state or province name details is where the LFI actually comes in. Because if we look at the script, let's go, uh, up one, SC, scan, scripts, slcert.nsc. The state was around here, right? Yeah, cert.subject. So this is where we're gonna put the malicious thing. And it goes, it's running here, so we wanna go up probably Two directories or three? Where does this run from? Well, I could probably go up multiple directories and then we can specify home whatever, right? So let's try that first. So go back to this directory. This is the mail directory we have and we want to recreate a cert. Um, country name. Let's see, we'll do MD, I guess. Some state, I'm going to do, well, I think we just leave that AU, right? We can just put the state here, put a bunch of dot dot slashes, and then home.sh id rsa to see if that file exists. Rerun this server. And then let's redo the mail. Do the LDAP add. And within the next minute, 
hopefully it emails us and we get a new PDF file. There we go. We have the email. So let's copy everything. I don't think it's copying there. Let's do this again. Copy the space 64. And let's see, go to the beginning of the line. V mail to dot B64. Paste. Delete everything that begins with B. Ends with a quote. A64-D mail to to mail to.pdf. And when we open this, we see our LFI as the state or province name and a SSH key is displayed. So let's copy this. V S E R Y L H, I think. Is that it? S C R Y H dot key. Paste it. And just eyeballing it to make sure it looks fine. SHMod 600 on this key. SH I, the key at 10, 10, 11, 163. And we get SSH into the box as the user. And now we can go into that incident directory to see what was in here. And if we look, it looks like there is um, a memory dump, maybe? It looks like a core dump, yep. Then a PCAP and a PDF. So I'm going to download all three of these. I'm going to do it the really lazy way. We'll just start a HTTP server on that box. And then we can do a wget-r 10, 10, 11, 163, port 8000, and we'll download each of those files to our box. And if we go into the directory it created, we can now um, open the irreport.pdf and read it. But the very first thing we should do is turn off that um, HTTP server. So let's go into this PDF and see what it says. Right off the bat, it looks like some type of after actions report. We can see the incident was a social engineering and execution of malicious payload impact they have as probable file leakage. Um, I'd probably put like compromise of workstation if they executed a malicious payload, but we'll see exactly what they found in this after actions report. They have attached a dump.pcap and core auto update. And it says an attacker has gained access to the internal chat application and tricked the server admin in downloading and executing a malicious file, auto update. And it looks like it's a interpreter payload. They see it established connections, but they're still trying to work on the decryption of network traffic. So it looks like we're going to have to find the interpreter stream out of this PCAP and decrypt it. And it does use AES, but because we have the core dump of the file, AES key is probably in memory somewhere. Um, it says, yep, the action's taken, and what type of recommendation. So they know it looks like a zip archive was extracted. So we should try to find out what that zip archive was so we can find the impact if that zip gets leaked. So let's open up the dump.pcap. So if I do, I'll do use Wireshark, dump.pcap. And looking through this, we can see a lot of data. Um, the thing I really like about this is the author actually exploited the box through it. So everything we've done in the box so far um, is in this PCAP as well. Not us, but the attacker, right? If I follow this HTTP stream, let's see, they're using this um, to put the URL and getting a body back. So um, I think just before this HTTP packet, they will go and build that um, uh, checksum, right? Maybe TCP stream equals four. That's not HTTP. This one, let's see. This is get status main. I think this is it. So HTTP stream. So yes, we can see them sitting the PHP session ID, 
to this URL, which then lets them um, bypass that signing thing. So what we have to do is find the interpreter packet, right? And I'm going to guess it's going to use TCP port 4444. At first, that's the very first thing I would look for because that's the default of interpreter. Um, there's probably better ways to do it, especially if interpreter was on HTTPS stream. But here we can see interpreter's packet, right? So we should work on extracting it. And I'm going to extract all the streams to a uh, single file because dealing with it like on a packet basis when a packet goes across multiple packets will be a pain. Um, so let's just look at a single packet first and kind of look at how Meterpreter packs things. And then we're gonna go in, extract the stream to disk and then work on something to decrypt it, right? So this is the very first packet. We can see this string gets repeated a lot, right? Um, I'm gonna find the a page that explains this, but the reason why this is getting repeated so much is it's going to be um, an XOR key, right? So let's go and look at the packet structure of um, a interpreter packet. And I'm gonna cheat a little bit to do this and just put the um, URL I wanna go to on my clipboard. You wanna go to this pull request, I guess. Um, you can probably Google like this header and find it. This is the best like spot I found that explains it, right? Um, so prior to the PR, this is what the packet looked like, but now it looks like this. So the XOR key is set to four, then it has a session GUID, then encryption flags, then packet length and packet type, and then TLV packet. This is just type length value. And I'm sure that will make more sense as we go and start decrypting this. But the reason why we see this keep getting repeated is the first four bytes are going to be the XOR key. And then these next 16 bytes is the session GUID. And when the implant first connects back to Metasploit, it doesn't have GUID, it's just nulled out. So when you um, XOR 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 with this key, you get the key again, right? That's just XOR. So right now the session key, which is 16 bytes, so that's four, eight, 12, 16. This is going to be all zeros. And then the next four bytes, let's see what this says, is the, um, oh, down here, is the encryption flag. And right now, this is kind of the hello. There is no encryption, so there's no crypto. Um, the next thing is going to be packet length. And this is where it should not be identical, right? So we can see 44D29138 versus 9053. So there is packet length here, and that's going to be probably the length of this rest of the packet. Um, we can look at that in a little bit. Packet length, uh, packet type of four. So after the length, we have the type here, and this type is set to zero because if we just XORed it with itself, yeah, zero. And this is probably going to be the TLV data right here. This is the type length value. So right now, the first thing I want to do is calculate this length because I want to know where the length starts. Is the length of the entire thing? Is the length from like this? Is the length start here? Like we have to figure out where the length starts if we want to start recreating this in the program, right? So let's XOR these two values, 9138 and 9053. I'm going to open a new Python thing and we can do 0x9138 XORed with 0x9053. Um, and we get 363. If we convert this over to X, we get 16B, which is going to be the length. And this entire thing is 1, 8, and 3. So the length of the packet is 0x183 minus 0x16b. And there's 24 bytes that are not part of the length. So this is going to be 16. And then we have 20 and 24. So the length starts here. So this is going to be the entire length. Um, so when we go to parse this out, we just remember where the packet says the length, it starts at that beginning, right? Um, 
And you'll see exactly why that's going to be important because if we're off by one byte, then every other packet will just um, be off. So the first thing I'm going to do is write a quick program using Scappy to extract all these payloads and just put it in one big binary file because that's gonna make it a lot easier for me to work with. So let's go and um, we can do it in Visual Studio here. Let's see. We have so many files here. Uh, what do we want to call this? I guess we can just go into this directory, new file, and we'll do extract stream.py is the name of it. And we can do from scappy import star. And we probably should stop our web server that we have running there. Um, and I think it's scappy.all import star. So now we can do TCP stream is equal to, uh, we'll just do it this way. And then we can create a thing to handle packet, global TCP stream. Um, if TCP is in packet, that's fine. We also want to um, say like if ptcp dot source port is equal to 4444 or packet tcp destination port. Then we can add the TCP stream. That looks good. I don't know if we want to add it as a string though. So now we can do this and sniff is going to be a function in Scappy and we'll say offline and give it the actual pcat name, which is, let's see, that is going to be dump.pcat. Let's see, the function on each packet is going to be handle packet and we can get rid of that store. And then f is equal to open, we'll say tcp stream dot raw, write binary, f dot write, and then f dot close. So let's see if this actually writes our packet real quick. Uh, no module named scappy. So we can do pip3 install scappy. And I probably have to disconnect from the VPN to install this. So we'll disconnect real quick, run the install, and then I'll connect back. Hit F5, and no such file found. So it's probably in HDB response. So let's go here, and we can say, this directory, whoops, copy this, like that. And let's see, cannot concatenate string. So where do we screw up? TCP stream, oh, let's make that a binary, there we go. No payload to bytes. Let's see, do I do bytes like this? Run it. Looks like we have a TCP stream now. It's probably written into one directory up, so let's just move that here. And I'm going to xxd tcp stream raw pipe it over to less because I want to make sure that it looks like as I expect it, right? And we see that 44d29053. So this looks to be like what we want. So now we can create a new script to process this packet, right? So I'm going to do new file and I'm going to say, I'll call this process stream.py 
And we start off by just opening the file. So we can say f is equal to open tcpstream.raw read binary. And if we look, I'm just going to move, or we can specify the directory, right? Let's see, copy this, paste like that. And we'll do f.close real quick. And I just want to make sure we can open it. Uh, F command not found. Okay. I don't know. Maybe I typed F in the terminal. But now we can open this. So the very first thing we want to do is get the XOR key, right? So we can do XOR key is equal to f.read and four bytes. So let's just print the XOR key so we can make sure everything's working as we expect it. And um, let's see, I'm gonna pause the video real quick and see if I can make this text bigger because this is where it's going to start getting important. Okay, I got it. Um, it's control plus to zoom in on Visual Studio Code. So hopefully that is good. Um, we have the key here, and what I'm going to do is insert a breakpoint, then hit F5, and we can try playing with the formatting of this key because um, it doesn't look like how we expect it. So I'm going to do, um, we'll convert this to integer, so int, then from bytes, XOR key, and probably um, big endian. So if we print this, and convert it back to hex, and we get that um, 44D2053 that we've been seeing. So we know we have the XOR key, right? So let's stop this, and we can get the other values. So let's do session key is equal to f.read16. And we probably should be XORing these values. So I'm going to create a function called XOR. And we're going to give it data and key. And I think autopilot is completing this for me. Let's just see if that works. Um, it may. So this session key should be all zeros. Um, so let's call XOR f.read16 on the XOR key. Go with this. And of course, um, it did not work. Maybe I'm going to uninstall this extension. Every time I try to use it in these videos, it just doesn't work. <laughs> or gives me something um, that I'm not expecting, right? So we're going to loop over the range. Then add that, return. There we go. That looks better. So we hit this. And if we look session key up here, we can see it is all nulls. Um, we could go to the debug and also type session key. Uh, I did not do that correctly. Session key and all zeros. So that is good. The next thing we have is the, um, I think that was encryption key next. So session, then uh, encryption flag. So encryption flag is equal to XOR F dot read four on XOR key. So that should also be zero. Um, we have the packet length. It's equal to XOR F dot read four XOR key. Then what is the last one we had? Um, packet type. So pack type, and that was also four bytes. There is one thing we didn't mention, and that is if there is a um, encrypted packet, then the next 16 bytes is going to be the AES initialization vector, and it's gonna be an encrypted TLV, but we're not that far yet. So let's just look at this and see all these values to make sure everything makes sense. So the main thing we want is packet length because that should not be zeros. Um, if we look at packet type, all nulled out, packet length, we have it set to something. Let's do int from bytes, 
Um, let's see, this should be pack length like this and 363. So that is good. Um, encryption flag right now, I want to say is set to zero. It is. So what I'm going to do is a if then, so we can say if int from bytes encryption flag is equal to zero, then we can set the TLV size. If the encryption is there, we have to um, do some slightly different things because that initialization vector. But for here, um, we know it's not encrypted. So we can say TLV is equal to XOR F dot read. Then we want the packet length. So I'm going to say packet length int is equal to pack length or int from bytes, pack length big. Okay. So here we can do f dot read, and we can say packet length as int. I don't want XOR key. Oh no, I do. Yeah. So that should be the um, packet length. And I want to say we have to minus eight. Yes, we do. Um, the reason why we're minusing eight is because remember when we we're going over this, we said the packet length starts here, right? Right before the packet length. Well, we've done two reads at four bytes each. So our um, cursor is at the end of packet type. So because of that, we minus eight because we've already read eight bytes of that. So this should be the TLV of the first packet. So we can stop run this again, if we do debug console TLV, it looks like everything may be fine. So the next step is we probably need to get um, multiple packets, right? We wanna go until we get a encrypted packet and then we can play with that. So let's see, we'll do, oh, we can just do else and then print encrypted and we'll break. And we're breaking because I'm gonna put this in a loop. So we can say while true. Probably not the best idea, but oh well. Um, so let's print something else. Uh, what do we want to get? Let's say session key percent s and we'll do a tab. Let's say packet length is equal to percent s. Okay. And I think that's good. See how this looks. So we have, it looks like two packets until we hit an encrypted packet. So once we hit the encrypted packet, um, the TLV, or we have to read 16 bytes for AES, and we also have to decrypt it. Um, so the first thing is going to be um, AES IV is equal to XOR F dot read. 16 XOR key. And we have to figure out a way to get the AES key. Thankfully, we have the memory dump, and that's going to make it super easy, not even inconvenience really, because there's a tool called Bulk Extractor on GitHub um, that simplifies a lot of this. And one of the magical things I learned doing this box is even though AES keys are um, like, they're supposed to be random, there's still a way to identify them in memory. Because if it was truly random, there was no way to identify, it would just be 32 bytes in the middle of a giant memory dump, and you never know which 32 bytes are the AES key. But um, 
forget exactly what it's called. Let's see. Identify AS keys in memory. It's like a key extension or something. Let's see. What is the exact term? I don't know it that well. Uh, you can brute force the key, brute force the memory, memory with entropy checks, knowledge of AES, and let's see. I want to say this is it. Yes, this is it. Um, key expansion. So I will look more into key expansion. Um, I understand it kind of like if you just had a large number of, or a large string of numbers, and you want to identify the credit card number, you could use something called a LUN check on strings of numbers because there is a checksum to identify if a credit card number is valid. This is kind of like the LUN check of AES keys, right? So hopefully that made sense. And as I did that, I realized I did not want to clone source. I wanted to download it, right? Because uh, I want to say they do have a binary just available for download. Uh, move, downloads, was it capital B? That's not it. What did you download as? Bulk extractor. Here, tar, zxvf, bulk extractor. Oh, I thought there was, can I just make, configure? I could have swore there was a pre-compiled binary. Let's see. Maybe not. Let's see, make. I'm gonna pause the video, let this make finish, and we'll have a binary at the end. Okay, the make has finished. And let's see where it put the file. Um, I don't know exactly. I guess we can do sudo make install to install it. And it's taken longer than I expected. So I guess we will pause the video yet again and let this um, install finish. Okay, it is now installed. So we have the command bulk extractor. And all we have to do is call that with an output directory. So I'm gonna make directory, uh, we'll call it bulk output. And then we can do bulk extractor dash O for output, uh, specify bulk output. And then the last piece is the memory dump. And we can see it's going to crawl that and put a bunch of information in the output directory that we specified. So we can see like there's a domain dot text. Um, I guess some of that is SSH connections, just bunches and bunches of things that were found in memory. And not all these files have something. So we can see like um, sin.txt, whatever that is, is empty. We can grep dash V for um, empty files and just see what is there, right? If we look at url.txt, um, I guess there is a curl URL somewhere in memory. There's information about an ELF file that looks like it's XML. But the main thing we're looking for is AES keys. And if we look at this, we can see it's the same key multiple times. So it's... Um, this string, it ends in C5. So let's go here and we can put our AES key here, right? So AES key is equal to, and then paste it. And let's just get rid of all the spaces. I probably should use like set or something for that, but um, it's not that big of a pain. Come on. As I say, it's not that big of a pain. It becomes somewhat of a pain. I'm not even sure if it's needed to do it, but there we go. And then to read it, we have to just convert it. So um, we'll do bytes dot from hex. There we go. And now we can decrypt it. Well, first we have to do from uh, crypto dot cipher import AES. So load that module. 
then go down to where we have the um, encryption. And what we're going to do is create a new cipher. So cipher is equal to aes.new, the key, the mode is going to be ASCBC and ASIV. And now we have to build the TLV. So we'll do TLV. And I don't want to do everything at once. So let's just do XOR um, f.read. And here we're going to specify minus 24. And the reason why we're doing 24 is if you remember, we did minus 8 here because the packet length starts before it declares the packet length, right? So we read 8 bytes here. So we minus 8. Well, we've read those 8 bytes and then we read 16 more. So 16 plus 8 is 24, so that's why we minus that, right? And now we can uh, call the decryption. So TLV is equal to cipher.decrypt, and then TLV. So I think that will now have a decrypted thing. Um, let's run this and just see what TLV looks like. So I'm going to run. We don't have a module named crypto, so we need to install that. And I want to say it is the crypto dome module. So pip3 install pi crypto dome. And I'm going to get off the VPN, install this module. Then we can connect back and see if it works now. Okay. So if I look at TLV, um, well, we didn't error decrypting, and I'm guessing that means uh, it decrypted successfully because we should get some, like, padding oracle errors or things like that. So, um, as far as decrypting goes, I think we're in the clear. With TLV, the first four bytes are going to be the length. So if we do TLV04, this should be the length. We can do int dot from bytes, and then big uh what did it not like int has no attribute from bytes uh we've done that before right and oh um i missed the underscore and that is too big um that's definitely not right so let's stop that and i'm actually decrypting this twice what I thought I told it not to do that. Maybe we weren't good with that. Um, let's see. Let's just call this TLV length is equal to TLV 04. So we hit it. And let's look at TLV length. That looks better. Um, now we do int from bytes. and 12, which probably sounds reasonable because this is going to be probably like a hello packet or something like that. So that's good. Um, the next thing in TLV is going to be the type. And this is bytes, um, I guess four to eight, S still the same thing. Uh, in the debug, we can just copy and paste this and look at the TLV type. And it is going to be uh, like 2001. And even though it's a four byte thing, they divide into two pieces. There's an upper and lower in this. Um, I wanna say this one is the upper and this is lower, but I may be making those, mixing those up. Um, right over here is telling us what type of um, packet it is. And then this right side is going to be the structure. So I'm going to pause the video and uh, we can probably just find it um, on Metasploit. So let's go back to here, go to Rapid7 Master. And I want to say it is, let's see, uh, lib, then where is it? Rex. I don't think it's payloads. Logging. 
look at one of these files. What changed in this? Scroll down. Uh, post, probably. Let's see. Post, interpreter, and we can go to the actual packet.rb. And when I was saying the upper thing, that's going to be like telling it none, a string, um, unsigned int, raw, boolean, keyword compressed. So this is the first integer. And then after it is going to be the um, specific type, like command ID, things like that. So um, if we look at this, we could break it out. So 0, 2 is going to be the upper, and then this will be the other one. So this is uh, 1. So we can see this is going to be command ID. This is the type of um, packet it is. And it returns probably an unsigned integer. 2? Yeah, returns unsigned integer. So uh, let's clean this up a little bit. So we can say TLV type 1 is equal to TLV 0, 2. And TLV type 2 is going to be equal to 2, 4. And what I also want to do is um, I'm going to create a, a num like a num module for this. So we can look things up quickly because me seeing something like uh, 408, I'm not going to know exactly what that means. I'm not going to know it's a uh, TLV type migrate entry point, which honestly, I don't know what it means anyways. I'm guessing this is Meterpreter migrating into a PID, especially because it expects it to be an unsigned integer, but I don't know exactly, right? But knowing this definitely makes it easier for me. So um, let's create a new file. So new file. And I'm going to call this um, MSF types.py. And we can do from a num import a num. And then we can do class MSF type a num. And here, all we have to do is create a bunch of things. Um, I don't know if that's correct. I don't know where it's getting this information from, but. Um, I'm going to call like ipsec is equal to one. And then what we're going to do is just execute the script, right? So I'm going to print and then we can do msf type dot ipsec, right? So let's go to a Python terminal, go in here, Python three. Uh, what did we call this msf types dot pi? And it prints ipsec. Um, let's see, if we do dot value like this. Now it prints one. Right. So if we print MSF type one like this, it's going to print MSF type ipsec, and we can do dot name, and it will only print ipsec, right? So this is going to be an easy way for us to convert things. Um, it would probably be better to like keep the whole structure how Metasploit's doing it, but to save um, some time, I'm just going to ignore like. I'm splitting up the whole bytes. I'm not doing it how they're doing that. So we're just going to start with these. And I'm going to create a temp file, paste all this in. I'm going to cat temp. And then grep-v for anything that begins with a comment. And then grep period. So we have everything. Pipe it over to awk. And then we can say print one, then equals, I want to say that's five. So if I do this, that is good. Put it over to the MSF types file, go here. And if we don't save, oh, what did it save it to? It's here. Process stream. It should be MSF types. Extract stream. There it is. There we go. Let's just clear that out. And then put a space there. There we go. So now everything looks to be good. 
I don't know why this started erroring. Uh, did I paste it twice? It's 405 here twice. It is. So get rid of that. I wonder how many times I pasted. Okay. That looks better. So now, if we go to Extract Stream, that's not it. Let's clean up some of these things. Process Stream is what we wanted. So if we go to Process Stream, instead of printing encrypted flag, we can now print the type it is, right? So let's um, import MSF types. And we'll print MSF types dot MSF type TLV type two dot name. So let's just see what this looks like real quick. We're on the print statement. Uh, zero C is not a valid type. So here we want to do int from bytes big. And I'm going to change the breakpoint down one line. And we see the first type is type bool, which I don't think is correct. I thought we said it would be type. Huh. Maybe that's right. Let's see. Process. TLV type 2, 2, 4. Let's see. TLV type 2, 12, type 1. TLV type 2, 0, 0, 1. Something went really wrong here because I was expecting... 1 and 2, and it did 12. Oh, uh, this should be TLV underscore type. There we go. Now let's print this. TLV type command ID. This is exactly what I expected. If we do TLV type... And then type 2, we get 1. Type 1 is going to be 2. And command ID, if we looked up here, um, either returns uint or string. Probably, yeah, uint. So, yep, it returned this. So, everything looks good. Now, the issue we're going to run into, and we can show how we find this. Um, Let's see. Maybe we'll just print that. Let's see what happens here. If I just run this and print. We keep getting the same exact things. And if we looked at like packet length, we'd see um, there is some wild changes in packet length. So let's create another print or let's just move this print up here. And say backslash T. Um, TLV percent S. You can break this up on separate lines to make it easier to read. Copy this. Paste. Now we run it. So we keep getting wildly different sizes, but it's always the same um, ID here. And that's because there's going to be multiple TLVs in a single packet. So we want to go, let's see. Well, first, um, we can shift this over one because whether it's encrypted or not doesn't matter here. But we want to do a while um, the length of TLV is less than zero. 
And at the end of the TLV, or end of this, what we're going to do is say TLV is equal to then uh, TLV TLV length like that. We're going to subtract the length. And we also probably have to do int from bytes because it's not going to read it like that. So TLV length int is equal to this. So all we did here is at the end of processing a TLV, we replaced the TLV variable or truncated it, um, removing what we just read. So now when I run this again, we're going to hopefully get a lot more than just these things. Um, most likely we're going to crash, uh, as I said. So we're getting a few more, like we can see a pub, uh, RSA public key, command ID, whatever. And then 2827 is not a valid MSF type. So if I go back to my types, we search, um, what was the error? 2827. We don't get anything here, right? So we need to go back to the repo and I'm just gonna search it for 2827 in this repository and see, that's not what I expected. Um, I was hoping to see the thing. So 2827 commits. Huh. It's probably this. Oh no, that's definitely not it. It's a TLV related thing. Odd. Um, so what we will do is a try. See if we can debug this live. Accept. And then we're going to print unknown TLV type and print it that way. So we have a few unknowns. So we can probably search for any of these. So 3341 in this repository. Huh. Let's see, 3855. Let's see, in this organization code. It wants me to log in. Weird. Um, I'm going to pause the video real quick and see if I can figure out what I'm doing wrong. So I'm not exactly sure what I'm doing wrong, if my script works fully or not, but I think it's good enough where it'll get us to where we need to go. I may have just got lucky when I was building it the first time and one of the random like TLVs I picked um, actually existed. So if I look at this, uh, we can see there's TLVs in other files, like this extension standard API TLV.rb. Um, so we can do the same exact thing here. I don't know if we have to do this, but let's just um, add this. And then we can just do the same thing. So go in temp, paste it. And then if we do the same exact um, cat grep thing, Let's just see what it looks like before we put it to a file. Looks good. Let's add it to MSF types. Go back here, look at MSF types, and we can append this. Um, some of them have this. I'm going to get rid of these because I don't think that is correct. Root key doesn't have something. So this is a really bad way to create the enumeration object, as you can see. Uh, I'm gonna guess is one, two, three, six, because the end date's one, two, three, seven, right? So that was an awk fail there, but everything looks like it is good there. Um, we want to go to process stream, and I'm probably going to 
ignore some of those um, unknown TLV types. I can make this bigger again. But what I was really interested in is the really large packets that we had saw. Um, I'm going to let it air out. It airs because eventually we do a read when there's nothing to be able to be read. So once that airs, we'll be happy. So yeah, we're trying to read, but can't. Um, let's see. Is there any large packets that we can see? So like here, the channel data. Um, this is probably going to be the zip that we're looking for, right? Because this is the largest packet. So what I'm going to do is um, read this, or I'll put it to a file. So we can say if TLV type 2 is equal to, and we can either just say it's equal to, let's get what this is. So we could say uh, 52, right? But if we did this, um, when we go back to read the script, we wouldn't exactly know what this is. So what I'm going to do is um, MSF types dot MSF type. And we'll say 52 dot name. And we can say TLV type channel data. Okay. And we want to write this to a file. So we're going to do, uh, we can't use F because we're all using F to read this. So I'm going to do F2 is equal to open. I'm going to say file.zip. I'm assuming it is. I'm going to do append binary in case like this stretches multiple TLVs. I'm going to do f2.write, and we can say TLV. Do we ever read TLV? Do we have the value? I don't think we do. Um, so we can say TLV value is equal to TLV. We skip eight because eight is going to be the length and the type. And then we just say TLV length int. I wonder if we have to minus eight here. I don't know. I would think we do. So now we can write TLV value. And then F2.close. So let's see if we actually get a zip out of here. So we run this. If we don't, I'm guessing we don't hit this um, if then statement, right? And we want to look for file.zip. It's probably going to go up one directory from where we are. So it'll probably be here. So if we do a file against it, it's just data. So we less it, maybe binary. I'm guessing it doesn't start with this string. So we probably have the value wrong somewhere. Um, we also have root at response UID. So we have definitely some interesting things. Like we can see a tmux config right here. So. I'm going to say TLV value. Let's get rid of this minus eight real quick. And then run it again. Oh, I'm going to stop. Because we're only appending to file.zip, um, we want to make sure we delete that between runs. So let's try running this again, see if anything changes. It's still just data. Um, interesting enough, it doesn't begin with that now. So we're still missing something slightly. I'm not sure exactly what. 
TLV channel data. Oh. I'm writing everything to this, I think. We don't want to do that. We want to put TLV type 2. There we go. That was an embarrassing mistake. So we remove file. So now that should be a bit better. Run it again. 2827. So let's put this up here. Okay. Run it again. And see what we get. And in a perfect coding, like this probably should be on the left hand side of this, but um, it's certainly a hacky code. So it hasn't written yet. It's probably processing that like super large packet. And now when we run this, it is a zip archive. So now it's looking a bit better. Um, I'm going to make a directory called zip. Let's go into that and we can unzip dot dot slash dot dot slash file dot zip and it successfully unzips. So we have this now working. If we go into documents, we can see um, that tmux.conf that we had saw. Uh, there's a screenshot. If we open screenshot, we see something really interesting. Um, the next step is going to be rebuilding this SSH key down here. But I do want to take one more thing out of this um, script to make it maybe a bit more sense, or maybe we'll just confuse everyone because <laughs> I'm already confused by this script. But um, let's see. So we print the session key packet length TLV. Remember the TLV type one, that could be like, um, let's see, that was in, I know where that file exists. So that was, um, I want to say it was lib rex, and then post, meterpreter, and packet.rb. So we want to just print out all the strings. Um, we could print everything we want to, but let's just, for the sake of this video, we'll print out strings. And that's when the TLV type one is equal to one, right? So I can say if TLV type one is equal to one, then we print the TLV value. And I'm just going to, eh, we can let, let it go like this. So we should be able to see a bit more. Let's see. Uh, it's not printing anything. Oh, um, we need to do the int from bytes. Int from bytes, big. There we go. So we run this again. This is value, uh, that's just a request ID, so that's not important. But like, when we get the TLV type file path, now it's telling us the file path is root docs backup.zip, right? So this is more just extracting more out of um, interpreter. Another file, oh, that's the same one. Uh, file name, bash rc. So we can see more details coming out of um, interpreter. Directory path dev shm. So probably CDing there or something, but yeah. So I hope you guys enjoyed the taking apart the interpreter packet. But now uh, let's go into the screenshot and rebuilding the SSH key. Um, so one of the amazing things is you wouldn't think it, but this small data leak here could contain the secret piece or like the secret prime used for this SSH key. Um, SSH keys are very big, but many of the pieces are known if you have the public key, which isn't really considered secret, right? So if the super secret value of the private key is in this lower chunk of the base 64, then 
uh, we'll be able to rebuild the entire key. Which sounds difficult, but oddly enough, the most difficult part is just getting this text out of the image. You can try using some on like screen readers OCR technology, but I didn't have much luck with it. I ended up just manually typing it by hand. Uh, I have it on my clipboard still, so I'm just going to do the cheater's way, right? And the first step is we want to be able to base64 decode this without any type of error, right? So what I'm going to do is add some uh, padding characters to the beginning because I want to get this uh, the correct way. I just removed it because I want to show you exactly the issue. Um, let's see. Let's base64-d, then xxd it. So whenever you see like the string of null bytes, it's probably going to be a terminator. And... Uh, Okay, yeah. So because we missed some bytes up here, this C1 is actually the length. But because we missed bytes, it's off one bit. So you get the length of 0C instead of C1. So that's why we're adding them. That's why adding them to the beginning is uh, critical. Because if we just add them to the end, the bytes would be going down here. And we're missing them from the beginning. So that's why we added them up top. So. Now when I do this, we have um, something that looks good. And this is just going to be random junk that we want to throw away. This down here is going to be the um, piece of the key that we want. Um, I want to say that is it's either Q or N. Um, so let us try and debate what I want to do. Let's just... Um, calculate the size of this real quick. So we want to go hex 0 C, uh, C1. So Python 3, and we can just say 0x C1. The length is 193. So once we get here, we want to go 193 bytes, and that will probably get us to where the next string of zeros is. Um, so I want to say this would be 16. Each line is 16 bytes. So um this would be going 31 uh probably 28 let's just try 28 so if we do um xxd dash seek 28 uh we are at the length so seek 29 that looks good so now we started right after the length and we just want to go um what do we say that was Python 3, 193 characters. So, dash L, 193. And here, we are now have the magic number, right? So I'm going to do um, dash P. So we just get the hex. And I'm going to put SSH magic. And let's just put this all on one line. And we're going to use um, RSA CTF tool. And the first thing we want to do is dump the public key because this has other values in it, right? There's only one real secret piece in a SSH private key. So if we do RSA CTF tool, then dump key, then specify the key of authorized keys, we get um, N and E. So the private piece is going to be um, Q. So SSH magic is really Q. So what we want to do, call RSA CTF tool again and say dash Q is going to equal zero X because this one is in hex. So copy, paste, then dash E. We can just paste it in this. And the tool is smart enough to know if it's zero X to use it as hex or if it's um, just number, use it as integer. So we can specify all of that and then dash dash private to tell it we want a private key and it dumps a key. So we can try this key to log in. So let's copy this and then v um, key.pem. Let's see, how do we paste it like this? There we go. chmod 600 key.pem sh-i root uh, key.pem 
root at 10, 10, 11, 163. And if this works, then we're in. So we know um, if we go back to the original question, that's not it. Let's just open up the PDF, the incident response one. But the original question of that screenshot. Let's see, open IR report of, let's see, the possible leakage of the target zip. Well, they didn't update their SSH key, so the whole server could be compromised because the SSH key is in that screenshot. So hope you guys enjoyed the video. I know it was all over the place. This was a really tough one for me. Um, take care, guys. I will see you all next time.